Hello out there, this is Nicole Hemsoth, editor of HPC Wire, here with another in-depth interview session. Today we're going to be talking to Carlos Rosales Fernandez, a research scientist at the Texas Advanced Computing Center at the University of Texas at Austin. His recent research is focused on porting to Xeon Phi, and he recently published a paper on the opportunities and challenges inherent there. Uh, we'll go ahead and link to that paper in the article that accompanies this interview. Yes. Can you give us a sense of your background in general and how you've become involved with this porting and optimization process at TAC and elsewhere? Sure. So my background is uh, as a physicist. I started working on problems that were too complex to solve in a piece of paper with a pen. So I started to move into computing, eventually worked in a couple of uh, high-performance computing centers in Singapore and the UK and moved here to TAC. In TAC, I'm part of the performance and architecture group, and part of our job is to uh, explore new architectures, uh, make sure that uh, some of the performance characteristics are appropriate for what our uh, users uh, need for their research. And that's how I got involved in um, in working with the Intel Xiong Phi. And, and so speaking of unique architectures and mixes of architectures, you, I imagine, worked on the Stampede system. Is that so? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, the Stampede system, as you know, is a pretty unique um, system. We've, I've actually built on that system from pulling cable to connect the network to actually start to work on the performance and optimization of codes for the for the Xeon Phi. It's a system that has essentially about 6,400 nodes uh, built with uh, Dell CUC 8220C chassis. Each of those has uh, nodes with two Intel Xeon uh, E5 2680 um, eight core processors, 32 bits of RAM, and one Xiong Phi uh, per node. It's, um, it's a pretty special system because it has regular CPUs. It also has um, 128 uh, NVIDIA Kepler GPUs, but it also has one uh, Intel Xiong Phi per node, which is something completely new. Um, and I think we're the first system at this scale that uh, made such a large deployment. One of the fascinating things about that system, too, is it offers the capability to benchmark on the same system, uh, multiple different applications and how they run on the two architectures. We'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's, let's focus for just a second on the porting process. So you know, the standard thinking is that you know, when it comes to Xeon Phi, the myth or the, or the reality, we'll talk about that, is that porting is far easier, but you know, the optimization challenges are really no different than they might be with a GPU. Is that, was that your finding? Um, give us some detail on that in the context of Stampede. Well, it's something that deserves a little bit more than a short answer. Um, it is far easier to get your code running on an Intel Xeon 5 immediately just because you don't have a new language to learn. You don't have an extremely uh, different architecture to learn. Um, so you're able to run your code much faster than Xeon 5. Um, it will take a little bit of time to get an optimized code um, working at the at the level that you probably want it to work, but it has other advantages over um, other architectures. Uh, for example, when you optimize a particular code on an Intel Xeon Phi, what we find is that it typically performs better on regular CPUs as well. Uh, so that's helping you even if you then want to move your code to a different system that doesn't have Intel Xeon Phi. It also forces you to essentially work for a multi-core um, system, which we're going to see more and more in the future. Um, so it's essentially future proof either code in a way. Uh, whereas with um, when you're porting something to CUDA and to GPUs, it, it is not all that clear that you are going to be able to use all that effort that you put into porting that code later on in a different system. Right. And, and from what I understand from talking to people at, at TAC and elsewhere who've done this, they've they've achieved significant imp uh, performance improvements by optimizing for Phi on, on just regular uh, just regular Xeon. Is that, is that so? Yes, that's true. Um, one has to be careful because if, if all you have to, to work with is a regular CPU and you're trying to optimize for the Xeon Phi, then you need to have a little bit of understanding of how the architecture is different from a regular CPU. If you just guide yourself by the profiles that you have, the tiny profiles that you obtain on a regular CPU, you might be surprised of the overall performance when you go to a Xeon Phi. 
And that's because things change significantly in terms of the single thread performance or the single thread ability to um, to achieve a certain amount of bandwidth to the main memory in the card. Uh, those are things that change significantly from a regular uh, CPU to a Xeon 5. So you can start working on your optimization from a regular CPU, but you're going to have to at some point test on the on the device to make sure that you're doing the, the right thing. So you noted in your paper that while executing code on the Xeon Phi in native mode is fairly straightforward, it can be a challenge to achieve good performance. The complexity of optimization increases as one introduces offload, distributed offload, or symmetric execution modes. I, I think that's an important point. We don't hear a lot about that. Can you describe that in detail? When you're running natively on an Intel Xeon Phi, it's fairly easy for you to isolate uh, problems related to uh, things like the bandwidth between the CPU and the card itself, or things like the network performance out of your um, out of your analysis. Um, once you start uh, working in offload mode, uh, the difference is that you're working on a very similar uh, framework to what you do with CUDA, where part of the code is executed on the host, and then you're offloading or giving away a kernel to the uh, to the coprocessor in this case to execute which means that there's data transfer between the CPU and the mic. Uh, now you have something additional that you need to optimize for, in this case, the data transfer. You need to make sure that you're performing enough work on the call processor to justify the data exchange. And that's something that it should be familiar to anyone that has worked with GPUs or accelerators in the past, because until now, this was pretty much the only way to, to work with them. Similarly, when you have a distributed offload code, you're going to add something on top of that data transfer, which is now remote data transfers to handle the distributed memory nature of the problem. Uh, you're going to have multiple nodes, each of them with uh, two or more sockets of CPUs, then one or more coprocessors, and you have to handle not only the data exchange locally in the node, but also the external um, data exchange. This is not something that is exclusive to the mic. This happens with any type of accelerated system, any type of heterogeneous system that you will be working on. Where we probably going to see in the future is more heterogeneous systems, whether with Intel Xeon Phi's or with uh, other type of coprocessor and accelerators. So this is something that I think we're going to have to live with. The advantage of the Intel Xeon Phi in this case is that you can actually run native. So you can sort out the problems that are purely related to the performance on the coprocessor, on the architecture of the coprocessor, separate those from uh, data transfers uh, and so on, and, and you can start at a simpler uh, level. Whereas with the GPU, you always have to take into account the data transfer, even from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Where where are the real advantages of, of GPUs then? Um, I mean, you're, you've sufficiently been able to benchmark performance and the optimization processes on both. So let's talk specifically about GPUs, the challenges and opportunities there. So when talking about GPUs, the first thing is that, that you have to consider is that somebody that's going to work on a GPU has had to learn the language, which means that they have spent some time thinking about how to rewrite the whole application, or at least the most computationally intensive kernels of that application. Um, the result of that is that once they start running on the GPU, they probably have a relatively optimized code because they understand the new hardware just because they've been forced to learn uh, how that new hardware works, to learn how to write code that works on it. So in terms of um, the first experience on, on a GPU, if you want, from a user, uh, might be a little bit better than the first experience uh, that a user has on a mic, just because as soon as the code works, the performance might be relatively good. Whereas in the mic, you, you will get it working immediately, but your expectation should not be that it's instantaneously wonderful. Uh, it might take a little bit extra time to, to get it working. So overall, in my experience, the porting to, to CUDA and getting something running there, it's a much longer um, endeavor than porting to the mic and getting something running there uh, in an efficient manner. But still, okay. the, the, other, the other point that you have as an advantage for GPUs is that, at least in the current, um, in, with the current technology, a top-of-the-line GPU will give you more floating-point operations uh, per, per second than, than a mic. 
um, and I'm using Mike as in as an equivalent to Intel Xeon Phi. The Mike is stands for Many Integrated Core Architecture. It's another way to call these these coprocessors. So if you just wanted raw performance and you were willing to spend all the man hours that it would take to port the code to a GPU, you might be able to get a, a higher um, floating point count. Uh, now, whether that's worth it for you in terms of uh, the amount of time that it's taking you to get there, and, and whether that's worth it for you in terms of um, how future-proof that code is, that's a different matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so you've run a number of micro benchmarks to compare various aspects between the two. I, I know attack. Can you describe those in some detail? Well, we've done evaluation of um, of the mics in in different ways. Um, I've actually not run most of the benchmarks uh, that were run at TAC, um in the Intel Xeon Five because uh, we had a series of benchmarks that we have, of course, to meet in order to get the machine approved by NSF. Um, and I was and I was not part of that initial set of benchmarks. Um, we are more concerned with the performance that these devices give a user application, uh, to be honest with you, that with the specific micro benchmarks. Because the value that we're gonna get from a specific micro benchmark, we can often produce a good guess just based on the architecture specifications. Um, and it, in addition to that, you talk quite in depth about the PCIe bandwidth bottleneck. This is really a big deal um, for, for both of these architectures. Do you want to give us some more detail on that? Sure. Um, one of the first issues you're going to encounter with any heterogeneous system um, is the fact that you need to exchange data in order to, to run uh, operations in your coprocessor or accelerator. Um, and the rate at which you can exchange that data is limited, uh, typically by your PCI Express uh, bus. Um, this bus is significantly um, slower than uh, the way that a good uh, general CPU communicates with memory. So you're going to have to be very careful about how much data you transfer to your coprocessor or your accelerator, and this is really independent of whether this is uh, an Intel Xeon Fire, an NVIDIA GPU, or an AMD Radeon uh, GPU. Um, the, the difference in the speed between the PCI Express bus and the memory bandwidth is quite significant. It can be as much as uh, a difference between 50 gigabytes per second for a standard grid socket to uh, less than 8 gigabytes per second to a PCIe bus. So, so this becomes an issue because you have to start working with more complex codes that do things like produce asynchronous transfers while they're still working on certain parts of the code and they try to hide um, the latency of the transfer through overlapping work and data transfer. These techniques are similar to what people have been doing for years in the distributed uh, computing world by doing asynchronous MPI transfers and overlapping those with um, computational work um, the issue now is that you have an extra layer of these communications. You have a layer which goes between nodes on a distributed uh, manner through something like MPI, and you have another layer that is inside the node that works through uh, this uh, shared memory system, and in this case through the uh, PCI Express bus, because in most cases the uh, memory space from the accelerator or coprocessor in your CPU are separate. So you're going to have to actually move that data physically through, through the wire in order to perform your operations. Right. And presumably there is work being done on just that sort of thing. So I, I'm going to put you on the spot here for just a second, Carlos, and, and ask you, what can Intel give researchers like you that, that would just be the, the cure for all of your ills? And then also what could NVIDIA give you that, that could really make your life easier? Well, they actually, they both do a reasonably good job of giving us the tools um, to, to perform asynchronous transfers. Um, the, the only other thing that they could give us is something that is a little bit less low level instead of having to specify directly that a transfer is asynchronous. Um, what would be ideal from a researcher point of view is if you just did your memory transfers, your data transfers to the devices, and somehow the runtime environment was able to decide oh, 
there's no data dependency between this data transfer and this chunk of calculation that I have to do. So I'm going to do those asynchronously without the user having to provide any input. Now, that would be great, but at a technical level, that's extremely difficult for either Intel or NVIDIA to, to do. So I understand why uh, what they're, they're not providing this at this time. Okay. Excellent. Well, Carlos, thank you so much for your time today. We look forward to sharing your research with our readers, and thanks again. Thank you.